Our guest is in the studio. We want to have a conversation about devolution. Kethenji Kirago is the chairman of the Intergovernmental Relations Technical Committee. Good morning, Kethenji. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. <laughs> thank you very much. Welcome to the hot seat of the situation room. Okay, thank you. I've never <laughs> been here. Yeah. Uh, so I hope I have got the capacity to tolerate it. <laughs> 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 we shall know uh, shortly. We uh -huh. will know. But to welcome you to the conversation. Thank you. City Muga, who is now on to owning a new home under the affordable housing program, mm. yes. has the day's proverb. And this week's proverb are from Guinea. Guinea. Mm. Mm. This country that is somewhere in the northwest of Africa. Mm. Interesting country. Mm. A cow that has no tail should not try to chase away flies. A cow that has no tail should not try to chase away flies. Mm. Bona Kirago, mm -hmm. this proverb from Guinea. Yes. What's your interpretation of it? I think, obviously, uh, the first thing which is clear is uh, you need, uh, uh, as we do in the fry whisk, you need, you, you, you need some capacity you need to be naturally endowed <laughs> to try to handle the fly mm. and once uh, the cow has missed the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the that, that tail uh, then mm. it, it doesn't have that capacity therefore we need always to weigh ourselves in terms of what we are capable of doing and what we are not capable of doing however simple it looks mm. yes always beware mm. of what you can do Mm. What you have capacity to do yes. and your, what you don't have capacity to do. Correct. Okay, that's a good mm. one, City, right? That is correct. Mm. And if, you know, I'm often asked by people who are asked to give us their opinion on the proverbs, they say, did I get it right? And we, and we tell you, actually, you always get it right because we're asking for your interpretation correct. of the proverb. Thank you. So it is not possible for it to be wrong. Yes. <laughs> yes. But in that respect, I would be happy to hear a different perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I think you actually understood it well because mm. yes. cows are endowed with the tails. Yes. We human beings are not really endowed with the tails. Yes. But we have hands instead. Right. So if you're bothered by flies, you'll try and swatch it with your hand. Right. So it'll play the same role as a, a cow's tail. If you, anyone who, someone who has never been near cows will not understand yes. this proverb well. Right. But if you have, it's mm. very, very, you can actually even see mm. the cow. Yes. Swatting the flies away. Right. Yes. Mm. So you are spot on. Thank you. Ponakirago, mm. mm. the IGRTC. Yes. Um, we've had conversations about devolution, about the Council of Governors, about uh, IBEC, about IGRTC, but sometimes we get confused on the yes. role that IGRTC plays. What is the Intergovernmental Relations Technical Committee? Right. In, uh, when, when the new constitution was established, one of the mantras of the constitution in Article 189 is that uh, the two levels of government should work on the basis of uh, consultation, cooperation, and coordination. So the constitution knew very clearly that these two levels of government, their relationship mm. and how it operates is going to impact on whether the devolved system of governance was going to be effective or not effective. And uh, on that note also, it provided that uh, there should be uh, a law that establishes and confirms intergovernmental relations in structures. Mm -hmm. There was a law uh, in 2012 called Intergovernmental Relations Act mm. of 2012, which established a number of intergovernmental relations structures. Mm. Uh, that, that is the structures which facilitate that which the constitution demands consultation cooperation and coordination between the three and uh, between the two levels of government or mm. even between therefore the county governments themselves mm. and that uh, and in that law therefore it is started by establishing what is called the national summit uh, the national summit is that organ between the uh, the president and the governors Therefore, between the national government and the 47 governments, mm. they are required to have a summit. And a summit is that meeting which brings them together, and they are supposed by a to have at least two of such meetings every year. 
Okay. So that is the first organ, intergovernmental relations organ created by that law. <laughs> the law also then also said the governors must have a council of governors. Mm. And the council of governors, therefore, was the other structure established by that law. Mm -hmm. The third institution which that was created by the act was the intergovernmental relations technical committee to be the secretariat of the summit and the council of governors mm -hmm. and in that context also facilitate the consultations cooperation and coordination between the two levels of government mm -hmm. uh, uh, some things have changed because of the way things started. Mm. But we can still say the Council of Governors established its own secretariat, given how things started when, when uh, the, the uh, transition to county governments took off. You yeah. know there was a lot of, you know, shall we say suspicion between uh, lack of trust between the to two levels of government. Mm. So in the absence of the of the uh, of the uh, intergovernmental relations technical committee the council felt they needed something else because they were not happy how the intergovernmental relations technical committee actually it was not operationalized until 2015 mm. and you know devolution started in 2013 so the council of governors took over with its own secretariat in its own dynamic mm. uh, but uh, nonetheless you know the summit of course then that just serves the council of governors we still have that law of uh, serving the summit but additional to that of course were other functions including there was some of the work which was left by the transition authority to be done by the intergovernmental relations technical committee the movement of staff of assets and functions between the two levels of government the whole issue of uh, when dispute arise between the two levels of government which is institution which they go to it is still the intergovernmental relations technical committee and we do quite a bit of that so that is where we, we stand as Intergovernmental Relations Technical Committee. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're like the transition authority, phase two. We are transition authority plus in phase two. A transition authority, mm. uh, phase, uh, phase two plus. Plus other roles. Yes, because, uh, you know, as, as it is, then there was, when the transition authority was there, initially, I mean, there was no summit. Mm. <coughs> there were no disputes that they, they were really able to uh, sort out between the two levels of government. Mm. There were functions which should have been devolved or not devolved. Okay. There, were, there were many issues in terms of, and there remains many issues between the two levels of government still to be addressed. Mm. So we are still in the process of transition to a fully and effectively devolved system of governance. Of government. And that is our mandate. So even as we do look at some of those issues, yes. if we establish this, so essentially from 2013, yes. this committee then yes. was in place to make sure that there was a transition then from central government to the devolved units, right? Or was it at a different time? No, actually, as I say, mm. it should have been there by 2013. But the committee was not established until 2015. 2015. Okay. Yes. So two years down the line, yes. then the committee was established, right? Yes. So before that, one can assume that, you know, devolution was trying to find its way and then how it was going to settle then at the county level and then in, you know, relationship to uh, national government. Right. So from 2015 until now, so it's been eight years since the committee has been there. Right. What would you say has been the progression of devolution at the county level working with the national government? And how have you seen that this has progressed to having 47 governments working in congruence with the national government? Right. I would, I would uh, let me, uh, when, <laughs> let me say it has been still a transition journey. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I would say uh, I think uh, you know when uh, when my home county Embu uh, uh, got the the Catholic diocese of Embu and the current county was a bishop, mm. and ten years later. I still remember that uh, the most important message he passed to the congregants is that we have come from far, we are far, and we are still going far. <laughs> okay? okay? And that is where we are with the devolution. <laughs> uh, we can look at the devolution uh, from uh, different two important uh, perspectives. Uh, the first perspective is what we call democratic governance. That was one important goal of it. That what wanjisikia wanajitawara. That people have some power in their hands at the local level to drive their own development agenda uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and to feel the, that they have a government. Yeah. The, the other one, that, that's the democratic governance side. Then the other one is about development, it's about service delivery. If you ask me, I would say in terms of developed governance, we probably are 80%. Mm -hmm. We are at A plus, mm -hmm. A level in terms of achievement. Mm -hmm. People have uh, erected their local leaders, uh, you know, who are more empowered. You mm. know, the MC is not the same as the councillor who was there before. The county, gov the county government is not anywhere, I mean, is not a semblance of the what we had as uh, local government councils before. Mm. So in that sense, and in many as important aspects of uh, democratic governance, we are there, 80%. Not yet 100%. Mm. The 10%, the 20% deficit is partly to do with the county government leadership and governance generally, but also the other 10% has also to do with the state of Wanainchi mm. in the country. And I couldn't elaborate on that, but let me be brief for the time being. Then the second aspect of it is, of course, there for the issues of development and service delivery. There, I probably would say we are 65%. Mm. We are to be plus. Uh, at B, not B plus. Mm -hmm. We had B, and uh, the reasons are again to do partly because of that twenty percent deficit in uh, in governance, mm -hmm. uh, in democratic governance. The whole fact that we are not at where we need to be in terms of that consultation, cooperation, and coordination between the two levels of government. I think in that sense, therefore, we can say, you know, we still have quite some way to go in terms of development and service delivery. But I think, you know, in the totality of things, and again, you know, we can uh, interrogate this. I mean, we come a wrong way in terms of uh, service delivery, in terms of development. In some places, they don't feel it as well as others do. Mm. But, uh, for example, if we agree that part of the reason why we had uh, devolution was that there were places which were feeling they have, they have been neglected mm. by the national government. Mm. You know, those people who feel they have, historical in, they have been historical injustices in terms of delivery of development, delivery of, uh, of uh, services. I think if you go to many of those places, actually they will say they are at 80% in terms of of service, service delivery. delivery. So there they will be A. And therefore, when I say 65%, <laughs> it is on an average. So when you say they would say that they were 80%, is this, a com is this in comparison to what was there before? So you're saying, well, in a place where there was nothing before, yes. now you're at 80%, so this is good, yes. as opposed to against another uh, level of excellence or progression. Correct. Okay. Because there are places where, you know, there are places where people feel, you know, they are at 50% or even 40% because historically mm. they have just seen things going well for them. Mm. They have had hospitals, right? Okay. If you ask Nairobi people, they have always had hospitals. Or, let, I mean, and generally people know, you know, places where they have all, schools, children have always gone to school. Hospitals have always been generally available to them. Uh, they have had a much better, uh, you know, they have had much better progression in terms of development because they have had cash crops on which they have made their money and so forth. And, and generally they have thrived mm. in the first, before devolution, they were thriving. Then there were those who felt, you know, I mean, they are really out of it. They have not seen anything. And some of them would, and I'm sure I'm telling you what you have heard many times, that there are places where they said they have never seen tarmac at the local level. Now their town has tarmac. They never had a hospital to talk about in that county. But now they have 
what they call level five hospitals in those counties. Mm. Uh, they had no doctors in those places. I can remember where I have been myself, and uh, they say before devolution, they had only three doctors in the whole county. Mm. Now they have 50 plus of their own. And they have recruited yeah. and they are doing things. And by the time you have 50 doctors, it means you have many more nurses mm. than you had before. So, you know, so we can say in, uh, on the whole, you know, um, it, devolution has served its, its mission, mm. but it will deliver much better to Kenyans in the future. When a lot more happens. Yes. Is this 80% and 65% based on actual studies and a survey that you've conducted? Well, let me say, uh, I think the most authoritative work which has been done on a devolution study independently has been done by a team that involved the World Bank. Mm -hmm. I happened by then and not and, uh, and gone into IGRTC, and I was a member of that study. It's called uh, Making Devolution Work for Service Delivery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is, it is comprehensive, it is authoritative because, you know, it is not, for example, governor, council of governors saying we have achieved. Uh, this was, you know, and uh, that was a team which had you know, a lot of Kenyan professionals as well as international development uh, agencies, uh, officers from outside and sort of therefore also a peer review mechanism. Mm. So we can say that that is one good uh, chunk of it. But then also we have got uh, what we would call, um, uh, you know, we, we have views offered by many Kenyans mm. in different publications <coughs> and so on. Mm. So we, we have an understanding which did Maybe what you are telling me is we need to do a study which puts parameters and marks to, to say the 80 and so percent. I used it as a way of, uh, you know, creating the a clarity in the perspective that I have. Mm. It is not, you know, that there is a study a which study can say IGLTC. 80 percent and mm. so forth. Okay. But maybe you are challenging me that we need to do something towards that head. I think that's one of the things that IGRTC should be even even benchmarking itself with and knowing this is how the evolution is working and reporting this to the summit and telling the summit this is uh, how it's working and these are the challenges and areas that the summit the president and the 47 governors need to be looking at we actually do that oh you do i mean we do okay for example you know we we, we lay out the figures you know when we next go to the next summit we don't be saying how many functions for example have remained to be involved to count in governments how many need to go and so forth and we'll be talking very tangible things we'll be talking about how many disputes we are resolving how many we have resolved mm -hmm. we'll go you know so and uh, we'll be uh, also be uh, reporting on uh, we have had some work done in terms of uh, uh, what would you say the, the state of intergovernmental relations in different sectors and so on. We have had some work done as IGR at TC mm. to say where we are in education, where we are in agriculture, mm. in terms of those relationships and so forth. Buana Kedenji Kirago is the chairman of the Intergovernmental Relations Technical Committee. This is a committee that is established to help steer devolution in the country. Ten years since the first devolved government came into office, how are we doing? Is devolution actually living up to its billing? Is it delivering the promise? Is it uh, serving its purpose? Yes. Consultation, coordination, cooperation, that is what should happen between those two levels of government. Right. And many times we talk about that consultation. Yeah, 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 it happens. It doesn't. For example, it was a long time before a summit was held and the first summit then that was held uh, uh, the other day in Naivasha came in after a long time coordination cooperation there are th functions that are supposed to be devolved mm. that are yet to be devolved mm. that's true that is true how many uh, are these and why are they not devolved well first let's uh, say that uh, they were not devolved because partly of how we we started with the devolution so you know we devolution the uh, was or could have taken two different paths. What's one, one was what we did, big bang, or it could have been gradual. Uh, and uh, because we started with a big bang, we started in a situation where this cooperation 
consultation coordination was not taking place. Some things never happened. It also was true that, you know, there were people who are not quite convinced about devolution and they were in the, uh, they were the ones who are holding the functions and the resources to be done. So we, we have under that situation uh, for, for a long time. Things have gone up slow. But I would say that, uh, uh, and I think the most significant aspect of this now is that uh, when His Excellency President uh, uh, Ruto came to office in, uh, uh, I mean, on, on his own inauguration speech, mm. he did commit to transfer all default functions to county governments. And that was for us. We were not going to wait for him to say more than that. Mm. So we embarked immediately as IGRTC to, to, do, to put together a program to identify those functions, to get the two levels of government to agree what needs to be done and so forth. And at the moment, we would say that it is now very clearly agreed what is going to move from the national government and its agencies to the county governments. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, we have also tentatively identified what staff, what financial resources, what facilities need to, uh, assets need to move with, uh, uh, with, with those functions. We have a process now by which we will present this to what is the other institu intergovernmental institution, not created by the Intergovernmental Relations Act, mm. but created by the Public Financial Management Act, mm -hmm. the Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council. Mm -hmm. And because what we are doing involves the movement of resources between the two levels of government, we are going to present that report to His Excellency the Deputy President, Gachagua, and uh, who is also the chair of the Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council, for them to see that we are doing things and we will not disrupt anything and so forth. And also we need the Council of Governors to give it the uh, ultimate, uh, well, let's say the also a, a note mm. because we have worked with their officers, you know, their chief executive committee members, the Council of Governors, secretariats itself, but the governors also now need to be taken through it. Mm. When we are finished with those two, then we are going to be ready to go to the summit for final ratification and then the functions will be transferred once they are transferred, again, we must say that it is a process. Mm -hmm. It is not, you know... Big you know, bang. I mean, at law, we can do it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the big bang is fine where things... If the actual people are where you are, you are banging them into... What functions are these that we need to devolve that would need to be to take some time? They are, they are, you know, in the, in the Constitution, there is what is called Schedule 4. Yeah. And it gives the county governments 14 functions. So in all those places, generally speaking, something has moved. Because under the Big Bang and in subsequent activities, something has moved. It's just that it was never completed. Mm. So, uh, I mean, if we take health, for example, you know, the county governments have been doing a lot of things. Mm. But the county governments also feel that there are many things which... It's not a feeling. It's also the fact that the, the ministry continued to do some of the functions which should have gone to county governments. Yes. So even a function may have been devolved, and most of it might be the national government, the might, might be the county governments, but there's a small element of it which still remains to be moved. If I can interject there, it, it's, it's a big element, isn't it? The yeah. finances of how um, a particular department will run is a big deal when it comes to then its operations. If the decision as per where money will go for health, for example, yeah. still rests with the national government, how then can devolution really be pursued in the counties? How can the devolution of health really live out if the purse is still being controlled at the national? And I think this is one of the questions that counties continue to ask, that health professionals continue to ask, that if they go to the county for direction, but the overall control still rests in the hands of the national government, how is, can you truly say that devolution then is playing out with health? Uh, it, that position is, uh, uh, due respect, not quite correct. Mm. What I'm saying is that actually a lot of things, the county governments have done a lot with the resources which have been transferred so far 
they have done a lot in the health sector. Okay. Let okay. me ask the question then differently. Yes. How does this committee then mm -hmm. work to ensure that mm -hmm. all that is needed mm -hmm. at the county level mm -hmm. for some of these functions to take place then, mm -hmm. how is that worked out? Well, what, what is worked out is that we identify the, the element mm -hmm. or that has not been moved, okay? Mm -hmm. And if we have identified it, then, for example, maybe elements of inoculation, which need the county government to, 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 to handle. Mm -hmm. then, then, in that case, we identify that particular uh, element of it, then we see also the resources which the national government, the Ministry of Health has, mm. which need to move to the county government. We identify the staff working at the center who are doing that. We identify the, uh, the resources in terms of budget, which needs to move with that. And therefore, the function will move with the staff with the resources, with the facilities from the national to the county government. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I said, if uh, for example, you look at health, again, back to what the first question you asked, mm -hmm. there is a lot which county governments have done in health, mm -hmm. very much, okay? And, uh, but there are still quite a significant aspect of it which needs to move to the county government. And yeah. uh, with the current spirit between the two levels of government, I think uh, in, in, in terms of what His Excellency the President Ruto has indicated and the nature of conversations he has facilitated between himself and the, and the governors, we can say that, you know, if you are at 65 percent, we will soon be at 95 percent. Mm. Yes. Why would we be left with 5%? Because there are, you know, this is a process. And, uh, and at the same time, obviously, you don't want to do anything which disrupts everything. So then let's say, Bonakirago, mm. counties have experience, 10 years experience in handling health. Mm. Mm -hmm. 10 years experience in handling agriculture. Yes. We can have a big bang and transfer everything on health and agriculture to the counties tomorrow. No, let me let me say this. First of all, uh, especially, I mean, and the best example we have for is uh, the the library, national library services, which we have, which this year will mm. be now from which have with the effect from July this the, from this month have been transferred to the county governments. Mm -hmm. What did that process involve? First of all. You know, we have libraries in some, say, that the three counties, okay? Yeah. Led by Kenya National Library Services. Yeah. You hear it is not even in the ministry. Yeah. It is National Library Services. Mm -hmm. You want to transfer those to the counties. There is a whole process involved. Identifying the agreeing, getting the two levels of government to agree, which are the libraries which are going. For example, they have the National Library at... Uh, at uh, at uh, 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 at in, Upper Hill, in does it does it go does it go to Nairobi or does it remain a national, a national institution? For mm -hmm. example, so you have that whole process of consultation between the two levels of government. We agree, but then also you have agreed that we are going to take this to some that the three counties. We got to be sure that they are ready to receive the functions. It also includes they have receiving the staff from those counties. Uh, we have also got a budget that they need to transfer of money. Now the uh, annual budget needs to go to the county governments. Mm. You know that that is a process which involves both the national library, the national treasury, and so on. Yep. And even after you have agreed that that money is going to move, it needs to go through a registrative process mm -hmm. to get the Senate and ultimately the National Assembly to agree that, yes, this budget now is going from this year to be moved to the county governments. There is what is called the uh, 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 County Appropriations uh, you know, uh, Act, yep. which therefore has to get that, in this 
case for the 425 million shares moved from national government to county government and it is a process between also the national treasury and uh, the parliamentary committees are we together and then also the staff we got to make the staff are comfortable that we are moving them to the county governments and we got to give them uh, you know induction and we have had to do it to tell them you know don't listen to what you hear about uh, county governments you know you'll be uh, you'll be uh, safe you will be safe and so forth you'll because get your you salaries on human time. beings so you can see it is a process it is not a magic bullet uh, activity but then when you say yes what you're saying is i am of the view that there exists a structure an overarching structure mm -hmm. that will enable this process you've described it to move seamlessly or to move in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a non daily systematic yes, way yes yes and that is our work yes because if if we talk about devolution and just the processes of it the discussion about complete devolution is what i don't understand because i don't think it is actually possible it is not uh, the first of all again back to what i said the constitution realized that you know i mean this is about relationships are as important as uh, the actual substance of things mm. which is why it said there is need for that consultation that cooperation that coordination because you are dealing with the intricate matters therefore and at the same time uh, i mean kenya is uh, is not a federal system it is a system in which the two levels of government are actually expected to work well together. Therefore, you know, you can even see situations where even those functions which the county governments did not receive. Yeah, for example, when you see Honapo, uh, uh, His Excellency Governor Zakanja doing, trying to do the feeding program yeah. for, the, you know, it is not exactly a default function. But... Or even when uh, the counties are giving bursaries to primary and secondary schools. Yeah. It's not exactly a devout function. The point is that going back to what I said in the beginning, democratic governance, you know, there are things which as a local leader mm. and with your own government, you cannot ignore your people's pride because that this function has been devolved. And in the same situation, we have a presidential leadership system. Mm -hmm. Okay? Even governor is not delivering to the people. Unfortunately, His Excellency, the President has also, is also accountable for the failure of the governor, mm -hmm. in the sense that he don't go to the same person to ask for the food. Mm -hmm. That is our system of governance, okay? Yep. Therefore, if children are not going to school, uh, to, to pre-primary school in an area, or if people don't have water, although delivery of water is an evolved function, His Excellency, the President, still remains accountable to the people. Your Excellency, we don't have water. And therefore, you are right that, uh, you know, what is important is for the two levels of government to work together to deliver to the people, uh, especially in, the, uh, in those aspects of development and service delivery, there is nothing like an absolute devolution or an absolute uh, 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 situation where one system doesn't need the other. And in the case, furthermore, that the provision of the Constitution is that for everything, for all sectors, policy development is a national function okay. the overriding registration is that of the national government yep. mm. are we together yep. therefore there is no one who has been given anything absolute in either way and uh, i would say even therefore even for those functions which are not devolved which is what we are talking about for example education and so on the county governments cannot say it is a function of the national government when mm -hmm. things are not are corrupting, uh, you know, if they see things which are not working well in their <laughs> own You'd counties. be surprised that they do. <laughs> yeah, precisely. They do actually say, <laughs> yes. well, actually, it is not our function. It's a function of the national government yes. when things like that don't actually happen, which is why one of the original questions was, how then are these county governments working in congruence with the national government when it comes to some of these things? Mm -hmm. One of the biting issues that comes, mm -hmm. obviously, in order for um, devolution to to be operationalized mm -hmm. funding is mm -hmm. critical to right. that Correct. oftentimes we hear of the delay of funds that again still come from the national government in order to make devolution a reality the delay is a problem there have been conversations with uh, the deputy gov uh, the deputy president to 
county governments about wait and see. How, in your opinion, sitting at the helm of this committee, which sees the transition, mm -hmm. does the tardiness of the release of funds to the counties affect devolution as a function? Well, it does, obviously. Uh, but again, it is not... Let's First of all, let us also be fair to government. I mean, I don't think there is a time when the national government has had resources, at least since I came to this office early last year, and to my observation, and even as a Kenyan, generally speaking, there are two aspects to this. One is, do you have the resources and you are just deliberately refusing to give them to the county governments? I would say no. The only issue which has been asked is whether the county government, disbursements to county governments are given the same priority as the government, national government gives itself the priority. Mm -hmm. At law, that should not happen. You know, they should be given equal, uh, equal importance. Therefore, it's back to what I said. I think as long as the two levels of governments are not talking properly to each other and they are not consulting, these problems will arise. But if they are in regular consultation mm -hmm. and if there is goodwill on both sides, okay, and for a long time, you know, for a long time, I would say until, uh, you know, maybe until uh, this uh, financial year or last financial year, you know, I mean, there has been that aspect where, uh, you know, the commitment of the national government to devolution has been in question. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Yep. You know, and, uh, and even in the current situation, where His Excellency is committed to devolution, there will be elements still in the national government who are not as committed as, as, he, committed is. as he is to devolution. Mm. And, uh, you know, in public, you know, in governance, in the uh, public sector, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of, the technocrats have also their prey mm. uh, because they are the ones who manage the bureaucracy. So that bureaucracy can also be part of the problem. <laughs> You know, when this conversation is had, yes. it always dovetails back to the national government yes. and what the national government does. But I think the biggest hindrance to devolution are the governors themselves. And I'm going to explain to you why I think so. Right. Because if we have a few governors, as we have seen, who are committed to utilizing whatever monies they have to improving the lot of the citizenry in their counties, if this was what we saw throughout all the counties or at least the vast majority which is not the case currently mm -hmm. then even all source revenue would be significant and we would see an upward trajectory because if you invest in the county and there's adequate circulation and there's a growth in the economy that county will have more money we don't see enough of it we hear discussions and talk about money and then the auditor general hits us every year with all manner of issues that counties have regarding the misappropriation of funds. Now, let's take the two, let's take the two things together. The one, yes. one is whether, how, how, how much more resources and how fast can the governors grow their own source revenues? Yes. That is the first issue. Yes. The second issue is about utilization of resources. Yes. So let us handle them separate. Yes. And I would say, in terms of growth of revenues, the governors, remember, have the same challenge that the current government is facing the national the national government is facing now see you are you kenyans are refusing to pay taxes we're no, not refusing not when we refuse you know <laughs> <laughs> well but there's resistance mm -hmm. are we together yes mm. so and uh, and it is said there are governors who have uh, who have uh, actually been very committed to raising revenues mm. and because of it they have been removed from office by the by the voters mm. Okay? Mm. Voters have rejected somebody because he has tried to enforce the collection of revenues. Mm. Because one of the things which you must not forget is that even at that local level, the businessmen from whom, you know, taxes are not going to be found from the peace and the farmer mm. who, we, where, where, who is getting nothing from their coffee or tea or from mm. their sugar cane and whatever. Are mm. we together? Mm. All right? So it has to be obtained from the businessmen in the town who own the who are the traders and so on 
they are very concerned. They don't want to pay the retroundational revenue that the governor wants. Okay, so it is a big challenge. And as I say, governors have lost, some governors have lost their seats because they have tried to grow their revenue. That's so true. it is not as easy, but I'm not saying that there is not more to be done. There is mm. a lot to be done, but it is not as simple and as easy the as it can sound. The resistance is true, Buanakirago, uh -huh. but there is also an issue that was prevalent with the local authorities. Yes. And that is what is collected and what is reported as having been collected are two different things now so that is now let us go there first of all let us therefore agree that is the first <laughs> i said let us separate the two issues yes. mm. that and, there have been we, many governors the, who have wanted to raise revenues yes. but they have to do it with the political sensitivity and those who have not been politically sensitive they have lost it mm. <laughs> okay so so it is a real challenge but the second one, now let us talk about uh, governance, okay? In terms of corruption, integrity, and so forth. And I will say two things. One, there are governors who also went to places where there were no systems. It's also important. Because if you went to a, a place where there were no systems, mm. and uh, even under their own county government and so on, are we together? Mm. You started trying to build the systems. But remember, you are building these systems with human beings, Kenyans who you know now. Okay? And I can tell you, as a governor, you can be very easily frustrated even as you are trying to introduce a system. Because if uh, 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 the people you are handling and you have inherited mm. have all in there have a history and culture of colluding to divert resources, even as a governor, you don't be defeated. Therefore, mm. I would say that we have made progress even in that respect in the sense that now many county governments have gone to digital platforms for revenue collection yeah and uh, there is definitely a, a strong drive by governors at the moment to improve on uh, on source revenue and to improve the integrity and accountability for the resources that are being collected we need more time for this conversation Kethenji. and thank we'll, you. we'll welcome you again thank you to come and join us thank you this is the situation room the only way to start your day